the soul music of rhythm and blues. America's number one luxury car. Hello, what's up Detroit, or even better, what up though Detroit? I'm Sheila Grant, host of Produced in the D, the place where we go back in the day to look at the things we fell in love with about Detroit. Now don't act like you don't know what I'm talking about, because I know y'all love Detroit just like me. For instance, what Detroiter doesn't love cruising around Belle Isle the first day it gets warm outside? And like we talked about in our last show, we love riding around in those clean cars that were made right here in the Motor City. The Cutlass Supremes, Cadillacs, Mustangs, Chargers, Corvettes, that's all us, all produced in the D. So that's why I'm here, to remind you of those things that maybe we've taken for granted a little only because it's really nothing new for us. Like watching the fireworks light up the sky downtown every year, or eating some better made chips and having a Burner's or Fago Pop. And yes, notice that I said pop and not soda. I remember the first time I had a Fago Pineapple Orange Pop. Whew. It was one of those perfect Detroit summer days. I walked across the playground to go to the store. I bought it just to sit and drink in the shade on my grandmother's porch swing. And I bet some of you can even remember when Fagos were like 35 cents. <laughs> well, that was a little before my time, I think. You know, it's those memories that may not seem like much, but really do hold a special place in the hearts of most Detroiters. Here's another one. How many of us loved getting a fresh new outfit, haircut, and doing it big? Not just for Easter, but for Memorial Day, the 4th of July. I know I'm not the only one. And yes, I know those are all national holidays, but I think it's here in the D where we've got to put a little bit of extra swag on it. And it's that swagger that we're going to talk about today. Let's go back a few years to see how we rock out with style and a love for fashion. Produced in the D. On April 2nd, 1881, J.L. Hudson Clothier, a men's and boys haberdashery, opens its doors to the public. It is a spectacular opening and a resounding success. And with this success, he keeps his promise. He contacts each and every creditor that had to settle for 60 cents on the dollar and pays them back in full with compound interest. This act makes business history and gives Hudson an unlimited letter of credit for the rest of his life. And from this moment on, honesty, integrity, and perseverance become synonymous with the name Hudson. To celebrate the store's first anniversary, Hudson uses full-page newspaper advertising. He pioneers a new practice of marking the prices on all goods. The old practice was to mark goods in a code that customers could not read. But these customers are important to Hudson. They too have come to find prosperity in this new world. Hudson throws himself into this enterprise with vigor and enthusiasm. He merchandises aggressively. Business is good and so is his competition. Hudson needs more room to carry more goods for his customers. He moves to a new building on Woodward Avenue in 1885. Six years later, he builds an eight-story building at the corner of Farmer and Gratiot. J.L. Hudson's was big in Detroit. I mean, it basically gave downtown, I think, like its whole economy. I believe Hudson's was like the Henry Ford of fashion. It was right over there on Woodward and right past Campus Marshes. People would talk about going to Hudson's like it was an event. You know, my parents would go every Saturday with their parents or grandparents. My grandmother introduced me to Hudson's. Uh, she actually used to work for Hudson's. My other grandmother worked at Hudson's at the, the main one downtown Woodward. She was an elevator attendant. 
I mean, she had the Hudson's discount and everything, so I always had gear as far as me growing up and knowing about Hudson's. Stimulated by rising sales and by Detroit's rapid population growth, Hudson builds a 10-story addition on Woodward Avenue. Inside, Hudson responds to the customer's shopping wishes and displays merchandise in glass front fixtures instead of in boxes. We had the biggest department store in the whole world. <laughs> Go JL Hudson! <laughs> Being a pioneer of fashion, starting from the 1800s, I mean, going back then in the United States, you you didn't even really have that many big cities. So to have a, a department store that big, you know, during the 1800s um, was really setting the tone for fashion. It was the busiest, busiest corner in the world at that time. Like you had, I mean, I don't know how many floors was there, but it was a pretty big building. So I can imagine how many people, you know, how much foot traffic was there, how much the businesses around there got business, so. I think it was about 14 floors on it, 14 floors or maybe even a couple more. Wow, that's what it was? They had, so it was all one store? Wow, are you serious? 14 floors of shopping for one store? That's unheard of. <laughs> I don't even, is that even real? Not even like the flagship polo store in, in New York, I don't even think they have four, they don't, they don't, they do they even have five floors? <laughs> I, I, I never even been there, but it don't, I don't know. That, that sounds crazy, 14 floors, that sounds amazing though. My first pair of Nikes, I didn't even know what Nikes were. And um, you know, my grandmother got a pair of Nikes from Hudson's and I think they probably, I think they were like the first pair of Nikes. They were like canvas, like they didn't even have leather. Probably floors one through five are gonna be the women's sections. <laughs> and then they probably put the guy stuff, the one, one man's department on the sixth floor. <laughs> and then the seventh, shoot. <laughs> we got three more women's departments and then uh, half a man's department and the rest of it is kids clothes. <laughs> so that's probably how it'd be. But I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, I wish I could see it. I wish, I wish I could see what a 14 floor mall looked like. That's crazy. I know as a kid in the 90s, you know, Hudson's was long gone, but I remember seeing the boxes and bags in my great grandma's closet, so, and they were like well-preserved bags, so I wonder what they made them bags out of. Good sturdy bags. The bag you would get there, you know, it was special. It was, you know, you, you, you felt proud of yourself to be able to, you know, shop there at Hudson's, so. I think, you know, those kind of things meant a lot to, to Detroit. The post-war boom is in full swing, and Detroit is leading the way. This city that builds the cars, builds new roads for these cars. And the move begins. It is a city on the forefront of a new lifestyle. In the visionary tradition of J.L. Hudson himself, the Weber brothers foresee this evolutionary movement and respond. With the economy on their side, the Weber brothers purchase a large parcel of land in the suburban township of Southfield and surprise the retail world by inventing and developing the country's first regional shopping mall in 1954. They name it Northland, and where once stood an empty field, now stands 108 specialty shops surrounding the Hudson's Anchor Store. Its success spurs the development of Eastland three years later. The name Hudson's is now synonymous with metropolitan Detroit. And to celebrate the unity between Hudson's and the community, Hudson sponsors the first 4th of July fireworks at the International Freedom Festival. I think Northland being the first mall in the United States is really just surprising you know, for most people, uh, even Detroiters. Each mall had a Hudson's or a Macy's in it. It's because they created it. 
I didn't know uh, J.L. Hudson was that deep. I, I knew about the store downtown, um, but I never knew that Hudson, J.L. Hudson started Fairlane and Northland. I didn't know that. That's hype. That's like right up under, uh, I mean, definitely not as epic as the automobile, but that's like right up under the automobile movement. I mean, to think about those malls now, well, Northland is gone, but the malls, for the most part, 12 Oaks, they're all still prosper prosperous, um, and people go there quite frequently. It's, and even 12 Oaks is like, you know, it's it's kind of, it's, it's close as to, close to luxury as you gonna give besides Somerset, but he ain't make Somerset, did he? Northland is just, it's legendary. I mean, just ask the Doughboys. You know, I'm not gonna say the line, but you know it. You got it. You at Northland every Saturday. You know, before you go to Northland skating rink, you gotta hit Northland Mall to get your fit. You know, your Tweety Bird jacket or your fresh paint, uh, spray paint T-shirt. So, I mean, it was definitely necessary. The mall for me growing up, it was like Facebook is now. I mean, you know, that's where you saw people. That's where you, you know, ran into people and you know maybe see somebody you haven't seen in a while. Eastland was our spot. Um, every Saturday we would catch the bus to Eastland or drive out there, however, but we was at the mall every Saturday shopping. Always had the discount on clothes my entire life. You know, with my grandmother working at Hudson's and me working in retail and my aunt working in retail, we just grew up as a fashion family. I think when they created the malls, the suburbs in general were like the new thing, you know, so that's kind of what fashion is. You know, you got to stay with the new trend. And so when downtown was, was the big thing to do, Hudson's took it to the limit. It's amazing to say that literally came from Detroit, but then it's kind of sad, you know, in a way too, that those kind of places are kind of like going away. Spring is coming to Hudson's. The latest fashions, inspired by this most wonderful of seasons. Spring Views, your first look at what's new. So if you think about it, J.L. Hudson's was like Detroit's Henry Ford of fashion. I mean, literally being the founder of shopping malls in the United States, starting in the 50s with Northland and Eastland malls. Now, I don't know about you, but seeing all this fashion history in Detroit, I'm ready to go shopping. I'm going to leave this on in here so you guys can just keep watching, and I'll be right back. The Temptations, Martha and the Vandellas, the music of Motown coming alive in the 50s and 60s, and life in the Motor City was booming. I need love, love. Post-World War II marked the beginning of one of the biggest economic booms in American history. It saw the birth of American excess. Having more and playing more. It's when we started shopping for leisure, not necessity. In Northwest Detroit, the Avenue of Fashion was where style was king. Livernoy Avenue between six and eight mile was a stronghold of luxury shopping. B. Siegel, Sibley Shoes, Jacobson's, Billy's Clothing, shop till you drop, baby. And now, as Detroit once again begins to thrive, community and business leaders are pushing to bring back Detroit's historic fashion. avenue of fashion, fashion. 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 and revive the entire neighborhood. Look, look. People have come out of nowhere owning businesses and walking the avenue shopping. I think the malls have had it, has run its course. We have so many mall closings. People want that boutique, personalized shopping experience, and they've chosen Livernois to do that. It's more personal, it's more hands-on, and it's more consideration given to you as an individual. Shops like Times Square, Goodness Gracious, and Narrow Way Cafe are building on success. Now what you have is just uh, a plethora um, of opportunity of business owners that are opening up places that meet the needs of the people not only in this neighborhood but those that are coming uh, to the avenue of 
fashion. So whether it's Cuzzle's Chicken and Waffles, our new coffee shop, Narrow Way, Times Square, the Shoe Box, all these different wonderful stores are able to uniquely give people exactly what they've been looking for in terms of a shopping experience. But I've got to say that personalized touch is what sets us apart from the big box retailer malls. And major development is coming to the avenue once again. What was once the B. Siegel building will soon be transformed into housing for staff and students at U of D and Marygrove College. It will also include retail space and underground parking. Any business owners that's thinking about going to business, consider living noise, but don't think too long because there won't be any space available. We're growing leaps and bounds and it's only gonna get better. There were people here who had income and there were surrounding neighborhoods that this was an accessible shopping area for. So they made it into this kind of exclusive area. It was the place to be. A lot of Detroit's uh, elite and power players, if you will, uh, shopped the area. It was famous for having specialty stores, people like Grinnell's, B. Spiegel's. It had a defined character and it did speak exclusivity in some ways. It was one of the first places that black people had wealth, so we were very conscious of keeping it in the community at that time. I feel like it used to mean something to be able to shop in your neighborhood and buy things from, from people that you would know. But it's Man, whew. you know, shopping can be great exercise, and I love being able to walk and shop right in the neighborhood. So seeing the Avenue of Fashion return to being a thriving shopping district is wonderful, and they have so many cool places that are unique to Detroit. Now let's check out some of the hot fashion trends that show how we do fashion in the D. style, we got our own swag, it comes with J.L. Hudson, right? Isn't that what we just talked about? You are not a true Detroiter, and I might be telling on myself because I don't have either of these items, but you are not a true Detroiter if you did not go to Detroit to get a fur, and if you don't have yays, Cartier glasses, but if you don't have either of those items, you are not from Detroit, so somebody has to take my Detroit card. Pink Gators, my Detroit players, I think that kind of symbolizes a lot of what Detroit style is right there, having, you know, gator shoes on, alligators, and, you know, maybe different colors, like showing your creativity, having, like, fur coats, and really it's like having the best of everything. Detroit is definitely known for gators. Um, Pink gators, Biggie kind of coined that, but, you know, he was just, he was, like, giving props to Detroit. You know, Detroit was known for gators. You get the gators at the Broadway and City Slickers. I think it goes back to like the kind of like mobsterish era, not like gators. I don't know where that came from. Meeks, it makes sense because it's cold, you know, it's cold in the D. You know, it's, it's, it's always cold here. So it's like, if I'm gonna be cold all year, I'm gonna be crispy and cold all year. I don't know where it started to for that to be like a Detroit style. Um, I think if I had to guess, I would say probably like Motown or something like that where they were wearing suits and, you know, had their hair slicked back. Even the store where the Gators are sold, it's called City Slicker. So it was just having that slick look. And again, they were top of the line. Gators cost like $1,500, $2,000. So, you know, when you would have a pair, it was basically showing that you were successful, you had on top of the line, you know, clothes. I guess it's old school. But I feel like some of my friends, they out there, they trying to get gators now, you know, people 20, 30 years old, they trying to get up there to uncle status. Like, I feel like you can't wear that stuff until you reach a certain age. Like, a 20-year-old can't wear gators. But if you're 40, 45, you're not a real man if you don't have them gators. It definitely came from a different time, different generation where, where people like dressing more. It's like D style, like Detroit style getting fresh, it's like you about to transform. It's like you about to change into a whole nother person. You really start acting different. You put the you put the mink on, the buffies on. It's like 
you don't even laugh at jokes no more. <laughs> you just, <laughs> you just is serious all about your money. And you looking at everybody else like, peasants. We just like flexing. We like, we like, you know, feeling ourselves. That's, that's D style. We make, we like putting stuff on and make everybody else look at us and like, ooh, I wonder what they all about. And I'm looking back at you like, don't worry about it. <laughs> One of the rap groups that we would listen to growing up, it's hard to believe, uh, but it was the Cheddar Boys. <laughs> <laughs> so it was like whatever they were wearing, right? Pink Gators, my Detroit players, Tim's from my hooligans in Brooklyn. Ah! Oh. <laughs> you know what? Let's be honest. Just about everyone in Detroit has either heard of, wanted, or has actually had a Mark Buchanan Pelly Pelly leather jacket, right? One of the first and definitely one of the most popular urban fashion brands ever. But how many of you knew Mark Buchanan started right here in Detroit? Pelly Pelly was founded in um, 1978 by a gentleman, Mark Buchanan, um, Detroit native, Detroit, Michigan. Actually started making the leather jackets, producing them in the basements of his home. The meaning of Pelly Pelly is leather in Italian. So leather, leather. The quality of the leather. Mark is, <laughs> I can't even say how adamant and how um, anal he is about the quality of the skin that he uses for his jackets. I mean, never substandard stuff. All the stuff is top of the line, very good quality product, leather goods that you can have these jackets for 20 years and they're like collector's items. I mean, so in terms of his quality, that'll never be compromised. The start of the brand was just to have something fresh in that category. Like nobody was really doing like high-end leather jackets that were based on the urban feel. The fit was a lot slimmer. Uh, some of the styles were a little cleaner and then as it evolved into the 80s, the early 80s, then he started using a lot more, as I said, um, different techniques as far as embellishing the jackets and you know, studying them and coloring them and you know, it just evolved into a whole niche brand. Oh, <laughs> blast from the past. <laughs> yeah. I just know Pelly Pelly. I don't know much, the, the big stuff on the back of your jacket. You got on a Pelly Pelly coat, you probably have money. When I think of the number one style coming out of Detroit, hands down would be Mark Buchanan and Pelly Pell. I mean, for you to get a Pelly, I mean, you was, you was the man in school. Um, so I had a brother and a, and a cousin, and we all had two Pellys apiece but we all went to different schools, so by switching them up, people in school thought I had six of them. Which is a funny name, Pellet Pellet. <laughs> to be able to go shopping at the Broadway to get a Pelly Pelly, Mark Buchanan, you know, for the Broadway was like, you know, like the ultimate. It's like legendary, you know, that's, if if, if Mink and, and Gators and, and really nice clothing, if all of that in the city started over there, then it's, it's ridiculous that my generation doesn't even like know about their importance. Pelly was like, if you didn't have a pair of Jordans and a Pelly, I mean, it's still revolving into the same thing. Like we used to get, when the new Pelly dropped, the Soda Club, the 78 to the 82, I mean, it was, it was non-comparable to anything. Growing up, it was like, kind of like mandatory. It's like everyone had one, you know, men, women, you know, you had different colors. You would trade them with your friends and now it seemed like, you know, you had even more. Fashion changes throughout time. Fashion is, is trendy, but Detroit style is always having what's on top or, or at least pretending like you got it. <laughs> Pelly Pelly, Al Wassam, Carhartt, Detroit versus everybody and many other Detroit designers are letting the world know the style we have produced in the D. Detroit versus everybody is the battle cry of the city. My name is Tommy Walker. I'm the guy that brought versus everybody to the world. I'm a graphic designer by trade. I was in my early 20s working for myself, but I want something larger, something massive, something that could touch more people. The idea of Versus Everybody came in the whole midst of the Kwame Kilpatrick scandal. You could turn on any channel and you saw Kwame's face. The idea rushed into my head about how impactful Detroit was. I gotta make this happen. 
there's not enough emphasis on black history. The impact that it had on our people wasn't portrayed to us the way that it should have been. I think that's why Detroit versus everybody connected. Detroit has contributed to America's culture, from Motown to Model T to sports. We don't get the credit that we deserve. So Detroit versus everybody gave Detroit an identity to be proud of and say, look, this is ours, even though it has infected the world. It comes from our hustle, hustler's ambition. Everybody, everybody hustling. And T-shirts, it's something that's not that hard to make. If you, you just need really one good idea, put it on a shirt. If people like it, you can sell a lot of them. A lot of creative designers here in the city. Even as kids, we was ironing stuff on our shirts. I think that Detroit brand will stick out more than this European brand because it's something that an entrepreneur made and you're supporting the city. They're all made in Detroit by Detroiters, people trying to be entrepreneurs and, and do great things. I like it. In Detroit, if it says Detroit, you know, that's that's what the new thing is. It has to include Detroit in it. Thanks for watching, and come spend some time with me again.